Digitalization is a key enabler for the clean energy transition. The transition to clean energy is picking up pace due to the growing pressure from the international community, declining costs and new innovative digital technologies. From AI to blockchain to virtual power plants and aggregated community energy models, which digital solutions will be most crucial to create more resilient, more efficient and more cost-effective energy solutions? Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to our online audience. Welcome back uh, to all of those joining us in person here in the Vetsal. If you were listening to Jennifer's discussion just now with the Irish Environment Minister, then you will have heard him talking about the dance that's at the center of the energy transition challenge, namely a dance between renewable energy supply and demand, between intermittent variable renewable energy sources and variable demand. And integrating those is a perennial topic here at the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue because it is so challenging. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that we are integrating renewable sources into an electricity grid that was built decades ago to handle fossil fuels. So, that challenge has now become even more critical as countries and societies are winding down bridging technologies like coal and gas, now more than ever, as we've been hearing throughout the day, maximizing renewables and minimizing emissions while simultaneously maintaining system stability is absolutely dependent upon accurate forecasts of power generation, of net load, and that, of course, is where digitalization comes in. And digitalization, as you just heard, is our topic here. Grid operators, developers, and consumers are harness harnessing the predictive capabilities of AI, of algorithms to both forecast supply and demand, and to manage assets and operations, supported by other digital technologies, ranging from sensors and blockchain to the Internet of Things. In this panel, leaders from government and industry are going to tell us which technologies they consider most promising and what frameworks are needed to manage both risks and unlock benefits. And we've got an outstanding array of speakers with us. I'll keep the introductions brief in the interest of time. Andrea Meza joins us online. You see her here if you're with us in the, uh, in the uh, Weltsaal uh, on the screen. She is Minister of Environment and Energy for Costa Rica. Welcome. Great to have you with us. And it's a pleasure to welcome Jan Lipavsky. He is Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. Thank you for joining us. We are also very pleased to welcome Dr. Alparslan Baraktar. He is Deputy Minister of Energy and Natural Resources for Turkey. Wonderful that you can be here, sir. And seated here in the middle is Sandra Trittin. She is co-founder and CSO of the decentralized energy management startup, Tico Energy Solutions. So glad you can be with us. And finally, I'm very pleased to welcome Anna Tribovic. She is co-founder and COO of the energy exchange software company, Grid Singularity, which supports peer-to-peer -peer energy communities. And she's also co-founder and vice chair of the blockchain organization, Energy Web Foundation. Thank you for being here. So dear panelists, it would be great if we could just go right into our dialogue and I'm very happy if you can keep your answers concise within uh, three minutes or less, please, uh, as we had agreed. So before I pose my first question, let me just very quickly bring in our first audience poll. And again, dear audience members, you can vote either on hashtag BETD2022 or with our digital tool. See, a lot of you have already found it. What should be the highest priority in digitalizing and modernizing the energy sector? That was our question. And our answers are a digitally skilled population and professionals, secure and efficient sustainable digital infrastructure, transparent involvement of citizens and protection of fundamental digital rights, or increasing energy access. So those are our choices, and we're gonna come back and take another look. I see right now we've, it's neck and neck between infrastructure and access, but we're gonna come back and look at the final result in a moment. 
Let me start by asking all of you to say a few words about which technologies and systems you're particularly excited about, which digital solutions you think are most crucial to supporting a sustainable energy transition. And I'll begin right here, if I may. Thank you very much for this great conference. Thank you very much for the invitation, me. And uh, my answer is very simple, and it goes to all technology and all system that lies behind and that enables uh, transmission network. This is the key for uh, renewable resources uh, to be integrated into network and um, uh, for these resources and uh, on, on the demand side of, 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 of energy grid. So this, this is absolutely pivotal for us to, uh, to, to work and create a reliable uh, energy network. And um, the power of these technologies and the way how the, uh, the grid can be controlled and uh, understood um, it, it's recently uh, the Ukraine has switched from the Russian controlled energy grid to European. It was a project which, which, which was prepared for many years, but uh, the current events, the, the horrible Putin wars, you know, put the impetus to, to, to be done in, in, in days. Without those kind of technologies, it, it wouldn't be possible to do so. So uh, for me, the, the answer is very clear. On the other side, every kind of this technology uh, opens uh, open space for hackers to, uh, to, 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 to have these opportunities to uh, attack the network. Uh, the more sophisticated it is, the more vulnerable it is. Therefore, uh, cybersecurity has to go hand in hand with that, and uh, we have to have also uh, these, also these uh, backup plans. Without them, it would be very vulnerable. So. Thank you very much. And we're going to come back to hear a little bit more about what your company is doing in this area in just a moment. I'm just going to jump, I'm, I'm going to take our policymakers first and our company second. So I'll jump over to Minister Barakta, if, if I may. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I would like to say a few words uh, about the recent developments, the, the negotiation between uh, Russia and Ukraine in Istanbul today. Uh, showing a, a, a slight but positive uh, improvement. So this is the, just good news that I wanted to share with you. Uh, and when I go back to your question, and I would like to just uh, approach it from a more macro perspective, the role of digitalization in energy transition. Uh, and the, gra the, the, the greatest challenge of uh, today's energy world is how we are going to have this energy transition, whether it's going to be turbulent or, or smooth, uh, that all we have discussed during, this, uh, during these panels throughout the day. And uh, the all indications as of today showing us that it will be a turbulent uh, transition because we all are seeing uh, high energy prices, uh, commodity prices, supply chain disruptions uh, in the market. Uh, and all these things actually started before Russian invasion on, on Ukraine. So, I mean, the market already started one crisis after another that you were describing in this morning. So uh, the indications, again, will be a turbulent transition. And to have a smoother transition, what I believe that we need to talk not only energy transition, but smart energy transition. And when I say smart, smart I do mean responsive, rational, flexible, and digital energy transition. We need to be uh, flexible enough and we need to realize the market realities. I mean, the energy transition will, will not be overnight. It will take some, some time to, to, to take us to, uh, to this 1.5 Celsius degrees uh, target. So we need to be really rational, not emotional, that we are showing very emotional and uh, ambitious uh, talk, but in terms of action, unfortunately, we are really behind. And when it comes to digitalization of energy systems, like IT and energy is converging very heavily pretty recently. But still, we, we are really 
behind uh, all these technological developments because the, the major concern right now, we have this security of supply. Now everybody is considering the oil supply, gas supply, and eventually the electricity supply, and how we are going to uh, have a continuous and quality-based uh, uh, power supply to, to consumers. So uh, I think the, 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 the macro question is that how we can utilize the digital technologies into uh, energy system in a more harmonized and smoother ways that we, we can discuss Thank you afterwards. much. Indeed, we're going to drill a bit deeper uh, in our next round of, of uh, responses. But let me go now to Minister Meza to get her, her take on the same issue. Thank you. And I will uh, do the same, take this broader approach coming from the government perspective. And it's a little bit when we're talking about this digitalization and, and energy transition. And I think it's very important that we keep in mind, at least from the Costa Rican point of view, that we're talking about the three Ds, decarbonization, digitalization, and decentralization. And this is definitely a really change of the paradigm of how we are doing things in the energy part, for sure. And this will require um, new legal frameworks and, and I think a new policies that will allow us to move towards that end. But I think it's very important that we keep in mind this 3D perspective. And of course, when we talk about technologies, um, we and, and coming from a developing country, I think it's very important also to consider the cost of these technologies and, and that this transition should try to be an inclusive transition and a just transition. So this is this will be some of the elements coming from our perspective. This needs to be uh, with this systemic approach. What we want is to decarbonize our economies to, of course, technology. It's, uh, it's a good instrument but we really need to take into account the rights of people. Consumers will be taking part of all these uh, mechanisms. And of course, coming from the part of the governments, we will need to develop good frameworks of, that will give good signals to the private sector that will uh, enable innovation, but at the same time, that will protect the rights of consumers and privacy. So it's how do we really develop a good legal framework and policy framework considering all these needs. I will leave it there and, and continue my reflections later. Thank you very much. And indeed, we will come back, especially to that initial topic you mentioned, governance, a little bit later on. But let me now get the point of view of our private sector representatives on the panel, starting with you, Ms. Trittin. So uh, thank you. And just building on what has been said so far, um, looking from the private sector, with the three Ds that were just mentioned, the digitalization is the glue which will bring everything together. So we have the decarbonization, we have the decentralization, but you need the digitization to bring all of that together. And with that, you have different focus areas, right? On one side, it's like, how do you connect everything that's in the distributed space out there, right? How do you bring solar panels? How do you bring storage, batteries, whatsoever together? How can you deal with it? And there, the first part of technology or area of technology, I think, which is important, is everything which is related to Internet of Energy and how you connect and interconnect all these assets. Then, based on that, you can work with all the data. You can work with the assets. You can derive value out of that. Might it be for more secure energy supply? Might it be more for energy efficiency reasons? Creating the flexibility and just what you were mentioning at the beginning, bringing the more volatile supply together with the demand that every one of us has every day and every evening at home. And here, I think technologies like blockchain, uh, which Anna will uh, for sure talk more about it, but also artificial intelligence, machine learning, they are all crucial technologies in that space. Thank you very much. And Anna Trubovic, uh, please, your, your thoughts on how what you're offering links up to what we've heard from the policymakers. Thank you, and, and as usually, I will uh, agree with my co-entrepreneur or entrepreneurs, uh, Ms. Dittin, in that the answer is all of the above. Uh, to, to save you the struggle of the poll as well, uh, there is technology to meet all of those objectives. We do not have to choose. Uh, and one D that I would add is democratize, which is inherent in the other three Ds, and I'm sure the policymakers would agree. 
and therefore we need the IoT for connectivity, we need uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to, uh, to overcome uh, the size of data because that can also be a challenge and to take advantage of that data to learn and, and to be more efficient and automate different processes. Uh, and then finally, what blockchain allows is a mix of security and uh, decentralized interoperability. Uh, so, for example, if we had a decentralized energy asset registry um, in, in a certain region, as there is a project currently in Australia, for example, uh, then an application like the one that Tico is offering for a virtual power plant could much more easily be set up uh, in that region or uh, an application that we're building which is to allow energy communities, uh, people to trade with each other locally and to consume more what is produced locally, uh, that could also be uh, implemented more and more easily. Uh, the one disagreement I have is, is uh, respectfully with the colleague from the Czech Republic in that uh, not everything is at, is at the highest levels of, of, of the grid. Yes, transmission uh, is, is critical, uh, but actually if you make it easier for people to engage locally, uh, to alleviate the strain from the grid, that will actually help you decrease the investment that is needed at the transmission level. And if you have advanced applications that are possible with technology today, you can also use uh, local uh, marketplaces to, um, to uh, support the flexibility and the balancing up the grid level. And this is what technology offers today. And our hope only is that the current events, not just geopolitical, but the climate crisis, which uh, is finally, um, you know, the, the number of people who are in denial are, are getting smaller, that this will accelerate um, the regulatory side of things, because the technology is there. I think this is, is the main message that we have today. And I want to give Minister Lefowski a chance to respond to that, but I also would like to add a question of my own, and then perhaps you can speak to both uh, points, because the Czech Republic has, in fact, earned the title recently of Digital Challenger, and digitalization already accounts for a larger share of GDP in your country, if my math is right, than in the five biggest EU member states. And the share in the Czech Republic is actually growing twice as fast. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you do see that playing out in the Czech energy system, in the shift to renewables, and then also, of course, feel free to speak to the point made by Ms. Trubovic. Yes, I, I will just shortly reply to you. So um, I was speaking about the whole energy grid of Europe, and uh, we have to think about big business and industrial part of the energy grid, uh, which I don't see to be a possible solve by this localized solution in, in, in the big big scape. That was my idea. I was looking at from, from that from, from top top down view and you offer the bottom up view, which is very valuable and, and I take it and in the end of the day it will meet in the middle. So both both of these approaches are necessary. And for the digitalization, so um, we are industrious country. Uh, uh, we are a country uh, which has a very strong IT uh, sector. We have many universities, uh, many uh, many foreign companies from US and from other other, uh, other states have own branches uh, in, in, in Czechia development centers, so it, it definitely helps. Uh, but uh, for us, since um, we do not, uh, the, the landscape of Czechia is uh, not the best one for renewable resources. Um, we are not uh, spurring these initiatives, which are necessary. You have to ha have certain environment. So this is something where we uh, we can do much. That that I would comment on that. So even though we are tech savvy uh, uh, for for renewables, we need new uh, new inputs. Thank you very much. And Minister Barakta, Turkey also is putting a very high priority on digitalization in the context of its Vision 2023, which will mark the Republic's 100th anniversary. So I wonder if you would say a little bit specifically about where you see special potential for digital applications in the energy sector. What are your priorities there? 
Uh, thank you. The, 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 to understand it better, what, what is the role of digitalization in Turkish energy market, you need to know uh, two things about our market. Energy demand in Turkey is growing, so we need to meet this growing demand. On the other hand, we are heavily rely on imported resources, mainly gas, oil, and, and, uh, and, and coal. So we need to meet this growing demand. At the same time, we are trying to reduce import dependency. To be able to do that, we need uh, energy efficiency. We have a very uh, strong program on that for 2023 and afterwards. And we have also a uh, goal of utilization of our renewable resources, solar, wind, hydro, and others. So to add all these two to major uh, pillars to deal with uh, our existing problems and also our uh, goals to decarbonize Turkish economy, which uh, President Erdogan announced pretty recently, in the year 2053, Turkey will be carbon neutral economy. So in three decades time, to reach that level, uh, to add more renewables, more intermittent resources into our network, we need to have a digital solution, digital tools to be able to do that. We have to have a decentralized, distributed generation, uh, great potential, our country, in terms of renewables, but uh, very di uh, diverse, uh, let's say, areas in, uh, re in terms of resources. And in terms of energy efficiency, which we announced our National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, including many different sectors, building, transportation, agriculture, industry, and energy. Again, we need digital solution. We need uh, demand side management to be able to have more efficient energy consumption. Uh, so digitalization is uh, not a, a luxury or not a, just a trendy tool uh, that everybody is following and Turkey is following, but it's a, it's a necessity for our uh, country. Uh, but the main question, and I think uh, we can discuss uh, in the second round, that, uh, the, uh, that how uh, we should introduce digital solution into energy systems uh, without giving up on system security or reliability. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah. I do want to pick up uh, very much on that point. Let me go over to Minister Meza, if I may, because, uh, uh, again, your country uh, gets gold stars for being uh, the Silicon Valley of Latin America, as it's sometimes called. You have a very knowledge-intensive economy that hosts 16 of the world's top 100 IT companies. So how are you building on all of that in your national decarbonization plan? What digital technologies do you see as particularly promising within uh, the Costa, Rica, Costa Rican framework? Thank you. And, um, and again, coming from this broader perspective, and because I don't, I don't want to talk about only a, a, a one particular technology, because I think that there are many important technologies in the different areas. And, um, and what I will say is, again, technology and digitalization are only a mean and not an end for something. And what we're trying to do is um, understanding, and, and I think it was one of the previous speakers that was saying, this digitalization will be one of these key components to achieve decarbonization and, and to uh, and, and to uh, continue moving towards these ends. And, and what we are trying to do right now, it's um, generating this enabling condition, um, bringing the right signals. And, and in our case, as you know, we are producing electricity, almost 99% comes from renewables. And yes, we are dealing right now with this other part that we want to um, continue moving towards the decarbonization of our all energy matrix, which, mean, which means at the end, how, seeing that everything, especially the transport sector, uh, will be using electricity. And this will also be um, uh, having an, an increasing demand on generating more electricity, and we will be facing the same challenges of uh, stability and flexibility but here is where um, a lot of these technologies and this different digitalization, we see that it will play a critical role. What are some of the big challenges that we're facing right now? And, and as I was saying is, uh, we really need to see uh, and understand what will be the demands or the things that we need to elaborate on the regulatory part. 
because we know that we will have more interaction with the consumers. And, and this is something that we really want to understand better. What are the risks again? And, and what are the right elements that we need to cover coming from this legal framework and this policy framework? And, yeah. and this is uh, some of the big challenges that, and, and some of the big questions that we are, we are asking ourselves. We want innovation, we want to continue bringing this innovation, but at the same time, we know that uh, there are many rights uh, of people and, and that we need to cover and there are some guarantees and we need to look for this balance. So we are really uh, having these big questions right now uh, and we, inside of that government. And we're going to come back to those questions in just a moment. I want to give us a look shortly at that audience poll we did, which talks about what the audience sees as some of the priorities. And by the way, dear audience, we also would love to hear your questions to our panelists. So if you have a question, please do send it to us via our digital tool or our hashtag BETD2022, and we'll bring it into the discussion. Let me ask you, uh, Sandra Trittin, um, as one of the biggest real-time smart grids in the world, uh, what Tico is deploying in the way of innovation and where you think additional innovation is needed. Are there gaps in the picture at the moment where you would say, you know, we need further work in this area or that area to bring this forward? So probably as a quick explanation, Tico is providing virtual power plants mainly from the bottom up. Um, so in the residential and commercial sector. So we are interconnecting everything which is in residential homes and belonging to the area of distributed energy resources. Might it be wall boxes for cars, uh, battery storage, solar inverters. And then we are providing services to the transmission grid uh, through fast frequency response, balancing group optimization, different kind of services. So the virtual power plant can act like a normal power plant, just without the gap, let's say, that it cannot produce new electrons, right? So, but the idea is to align the demand better with the volatile production of the renewable energies. Now, where is the gap? The gap is quite a lot at the moment in the policy area, so in the new regulations, because not all the markets are open yet not even in Europe, not worldwide, to allow these kind of systems. And they will be crucial for the future um, to utilize all the assets that we are building anyway and that every one of us is building probably with solar, rooftop, etc. cetera. Um, but the policy just does not allow access to markets. This is one thing. The second thing is that at some points, uh, and I'm building a bit on what Anna was saying also, there are local markets missing. Um, so, for example, we could think about uh, local flexibility markets, not only on the transmission grid, but also on the distribution grid level. Just, there is no market at all. It's not that there is just policy missing, but there is a market mechanism at all missing. But it will be useful, and then the question on how does it interact with the transmission grid, right, over the different levels. So, I think this is one thing. The second part, which I think is also important, is how can we create financial, let's say, stability for investments into that field? Because if you invest into energy efficiency or if you invest into flexibility, it's nothing that you can hold on, right? If you're building up a gas power station, you know, okay, I have to go through a certain process, it will be built, and then I have a running time of probably 40 to 60 years, I can see it, I can see the electrons. But if you're building up a virtual power plant, it takes you probably 2,000 homes, which you first have to convince to join your business model, then you have to interconnect them, then you have to um, work also with these clients, right? And then you need to have the market access, and then you can provide the service. And this creates often the problem that investors are saying, well, it sounds nice, right? But uh, it's a bit unsecure, it's a bit risky, so probably I might better stick with my investment for the gas power station. Um, and there are many, many other uh, examples out there. Also, if you are thinking about the topic of energy communities, right? If you want to build up an energy community nowadays where you can do a peer-to-peer -peer trading, who, which investor is really going to take the risk at the moment to say, I'm going to build that up. Because there are so many unsecure pieces in the system, but at one point we have to start. 
I see Minister Barakta wanting to weigh no, in I, here. I, I was just going to say, now his gas power plants are also too risky, you know, <laughs> to whether we will find a gas or not. <laughs> Thank you for weighing in on that. So let me go over to Anna Tribovic, because in fact, uh, blockchain is a technology where there are a number of potential use cases in the energy sector. And certainly right here in Berlin, lots of startups trying to position themselves to be part of this. Are there nonetheless also gaps, would you say, when you look at the overall picture, uh, whether in innovation or in, in governance and investment structures? Um, normally, policy is technology agnostic, and, and I believe everyone in the room knows that, and this is how policymakers act. You do not uh, permit uh, normally or uh, forbid a certain technology to be used. However, uh, policy is more to do how that technology is used. So what can you do, uh, what can you make happen with that technology? And this is why we do have a gap. Uh, we have a gap in that something is possible technically, uh, something that could have a significant impact, uh, but the policy does not recognize that type of uh, an operation on the market. And this is exactly what, what Sandra was also saying just, just earlier. So for example, if you look at the perspective of how much you need to invest, that could also be zero, right? It all depends on how connected uh, the energy assets are, which is why you need this infrastructure. I mentioned one project, which is a decentralized energy asset registry. Why is that important? Because each energy asset would have an ID and would be able to interact with different applications seamlessly in that you would not need a manager, organizer. It would be as simple as using an app on your phone. And this is where we need to get to. It needs to be easy for assets to connect. It needs to become a lot easier for people to invest in and install renewable assets. It is, uh, to me, I, I do not understand to this day why it is so difficult to do that. Uh, why, you know, everyone, why would not be just very normal, just like you buy a fridge or, 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 or whatever device you buy, that you also buy a solar panel, a heat pump, whatever it is. Uh, at the moment, uh, there, I know there is a skills shortage uh, that, you know, installation companies do not even have sales departments anymore because they have too much work. Uh, we also have uh, a shortage of some of those renewables. Uh, the EU recently asked the heat pump producers to increase their production. Uh, so, so there are some gaps there as well. Um, on the core infrastructure, uh, there are some projects like the ones I mentioned where the governments could make uh, a lot of progress with uh, very limited investment. And um, one example that was given about energy communities is one where there is a very um, enabling legislation, for example, at the EU level, uh, but when you come to the EU member level, uh, then either they do not uh, explain how the directive can be, uh, can be implemented in practice, uh, or, uh, or they do allow its implementation, but in a very limited way. For example, you can set up an energy community, you can even uh, do peer-to-peer -peer trading, but you do not do this based on market conditions. You do not do this in a way that you can respond to a dynamic tariff from a distribution operator and assist with flexibility and balancing first at that level and then up the grid. You do it based on a predetermined pricing scheme. Uh, and while it is good to encourage people to self-consume, it may also be counter-effective if the market uh, really wants you to support flexibility and if that is a more productive way of use of that particular resource at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly there are gaps. Uh, while there is technology to allow a much more optimal use of renewables, and also that would encourage individuals to invest more in renewables and to really activate the citizen in this process, not to have the entire burden at the central government side. Thanks very much. Let me get the, uh, our technici technical team to please show us the results of our audience poll because I'd like to now talk, do a deeper dive on governance and what's needed uh, in that uh, area. So if we could see those results, here they are. 
And what we see, we'd asked what, is, what should be the highest priority in digitalizing and modernizing the energy sector, and we see that 55% of those who responded said secure and efficient sustainable digital infrastructure. And then the next largest share, 20% say increasing energy access, then we have 18% saying a digitally skilled population and highly skilled digital professionals. You, in fact, talked about lack of, uh, of staff in some cases, skill shortages. And finally, transparent involvement of citizens and protection of fundamental digital rights. That's just 6%, which is interesting. Um, fairly low share concerned about that. Um, Minister Lipowski, you would like to comment? Yes, I think the, the, the last option is it's very connected to the first one actually because fundamental digital rights and secure um, uh, and efficient sustainable uh, digital infrastructure cannot be created without uh, without these uh, without these rights and uh, it comes to my question and my point I wanted to raise during this debate we gather a lot of data we get a vast amount of data where do we store them under which conditions who will access to them, how this will be regulated. This is a, this is a fundamental question for EU, for Europe. Uh, we have to be looking for, for these answers. Do we want to share them with our friends in the US? Do we want to send them to China? Do we want to, how, how do we work this data set? So this is something where I see a role of politicians to be actively answering those questions. And what's your answer to some of those questions? For example, there's an, a very ongoing controversial debate about whether Europe needs its own cloud. Yes, uh, it is ongoing debate, and I, I feel there's some progress in in, in talks uh, with uh, with the U.S. side, and uh, this is this is exactly the debate I'm I'm point, pointing to. And yes, we have to find ways how to how to protect data in in Europe to to, to have a control over them, uh, but not to lose connection to to uh, know how and um, um, know how how and how, how to put it mildly, um, uh, the minds of the uh, rest of the democratic world, US, Japan, Taiwan, for example, Australia, we want to have them on board when we speak about digitalization and creating a new, new things. Let me ask everybody else to give their perspective on the poll results and also in general on the question of what you see as the most important prerequisites for policymakers to be setting when it comes to deployment of digital technology. So I'll first take the policymakers and then I'll come to our um, our business uh, our business representative. Please, Minister uh, Barakta. Thank you. Well, I mean, when I see the result of the poll, uh, it shows also today's uh, biggest concern about energy, you know, the security of supply, uh, the efficiency uh, problems and sustainability questions uh, comes everybody's mind. So uh, this is kind of also uh, affected, I believe, the, the current realities and concerns. Uh, when it comes to uh, the role of uh, the, the right governance of the digital deployment, uh, I think uh, the most important challenge is the, the regulatory challenge. I agree with that. And uh, as a former regulator, I can tell you a secret. Uh, I'm sure you know it. But uh, the problem with the regulatory world is, uh, and especially these new technologies, technologies or digitalization, that we need to uh, somehow increase uh, and train the regulators as well, because we... we they basically don't understand the, 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 how the system works. And when they don't understand, the obvious uh, reaction from them is just to not to deploy anything, because we all know very conventionally, we do tariff regulation, uh, we do uh, licensing, market entry and exit. These are the tools as a regulator that they use, uh, I used to, uh, I used to uh, use. So, uh, the, the stakeholder management, regulators, policymakers, consumers. I mean, I was a little bit surprised and disappointed about the role of citizens that uh, it, it seems like a 6% is quite low. But I think the most important part is a consumer empowerment and the role of uh, consumers to involve in this uh, digit, new digital world, new digital energy world. So 
uh, we, we need to increase the awareness of the people, how they are going to engage with the, the market activities, how they can play a different role in the market in terms of uh, uh, consumers. Uh, but first and foremost, also, I would say that the right market design, we need a new market design for this digital energy world. Mm -hmm. To have that, uh, we need to digitalize the system, we need to uh, make the system intelligent or smart, uh, and we need to protect the system, the cybersecurity that we all referring to. Uh, so these are the key factors that we need, to, uh, we need to have. Just before you put your mic down, um, what would you say, both as a former regulator and as a current policymaker, to Sandra Trutin's remark that, in fact, there are technologies out there that can't be introduced to the market because the regulatory system isn't able, to, essentially, to um, conceive of them within the existing framework? Are, is that a problem you're aware of, our regulators and well, policymakers? We, we, we do aware of, but the problem is, I, I think you will all agree with me that the, this new technologies, digitalization is uh, uh, continuously improving. It's not like a, the mature system that we are going to introduce. So we don't know, we are so insecure and we don't know how we are going to implement the right policies, right incentives, right legislation that it will allow us, uh, we will avoid any stranded assets, stranded costs and sunk costs. Because eventually there will be new things coming into online and uh, this, I mean, that, that's that, I think, the main problem. And I hope uh, that we will learn more and we engage more with the, with the, uh, the relevant actors uh, to introduce the right policies and uh, set of regulations. And I saw Minister Meza shaking, nodding her head quite emphatically. So I'll go to you now for a comment on the same question. <laughs> uh, I totally echoed what, what the minister has, has said. I think, I mean, we are building a new market and, and we are building a new way of, of managing the whole energy, energy system. And, and this is why we don't have the, the answers right now. And, and we need to be very clear and, and aware of these aspects. But this is why it's so important that we really need to keep in mind what are the main goals of this because then we can really lose ourselves if we are not clear on why are we doing this. And these are the kind of questions that as policymakers, we really need to have these in the center uh, of the things and the discussions. Uh, we are doing this because we want to decarbonize our economies. We are doing this because we want to have also a, a better uh, system and a better economy for all the people. And, and this is also an inclusion aspect that, that I want to bring here. Uh, this is for the people. And, and that's why I was very surprised looking at the, at the answers of, of the polls as well. And, and I was, I totally agree. I think it was the first minister who mentioned, uh, we will be generating and we will be having a lot of information uh, from the consumers, that consumers will be there in this interaction. And this, I think this is great, this is fantastic, but at the same time, um, what are we going to do with all this information? How are we going to use it? Um, is everyone so clear that we will be having access to all this information? So um, I think that this is about understanding this part, um, but I also i am very clear that and, and coming and, and hearing uh, the other panelists from the private sector. It's so clear that we also need to understand that everything is changing right now and that we need to cover the risk, sending the right signals that we know that the, this technology will allow us to achieve the main goals that we want to achieve. So it's, it's a complex moment. Uh, and my, my main point here is not to lose the big objectives because nothing is clear right now. We are writing the future and it's so important to have clear goals uh, coming from the policy from the policy part. Why are we doing this? Be asking ourselves all the time because otherwise just technology for technology, digitalization for digitalization can also become 
uh, a, a very big risk and can leave a lot of people out of the system if we don't do this having the, the people, the human being in the center and of course our environmental goals there very clear as part of, of all this transition. So let me now go to the two innovators on the panel and certainly if you like give us your response to what the, uh, to the poll results and how you see them. But then I'd also like you to talk about finding this balance between policy frameworks as enablers that allow the new, the technologies that are available and future not yet fully, uh, fully uh, optimized technologies to flow into the market and at the same time address the risks that need to be dealt with. So finding that balance. But first, if you'd like, uh, j just tell us your brief uh, response to the poll. Um, so I only have two reactions to that. So one reaction was that for the uh, secure infrastructure, for me, the key word in that, in that question was the digital infrastructure, which means on the different levels, like if you're looking to the different levels of the energy system, I think the consumer, for example, has no understanding what it means to digitalize on the transmission grid level, right? That just happens by itself. Um, you bring in more technology, you have more overview, you have more data, etc. But where it becomes interesting, and this is relating to the last point or to the last question um, with the limited number of percentage, right, where people said like digital rights are like, let's say, uh, less, less important. I think what people have understood already is that, yes, for sure, we need to have some basic privacy rights. But on the other side, to be honest, who cares about how much energy I consume every day? I mean, would you all be interested in seeing that or seeing my energy bill, like if it's like 100 euros up or down? I'm personally interested, right? Because I want to see how much I saved in comparison to last year. But, you know, if anyone sees it out there, I personally don't, don't care too much. And I think it might be also a question of generation. Um, this just as a, as a thought, I'm not saying that I'm fully agreeing with that, but it's more um, my interpretation of the, of the results. Then in terms of the policy, um, what the minister was just saying before, I think that's really a problem is the matter of speed. Technology and especially in the digitalization is developing so quick, uh, whereas policy making just takes the time. Mm -hmm. And this difference in speed creates quite some tension. Um, I think we have all seen that in the country where we are at the moment, in Germany with the smart metering. Uh, where there was a good approach in bringing smart metering uh, full scale into the country, whereas all the technology providers, or most of them, are thinking, well, it's a good approach, but it's like 10 years old already. But it's normal, right? Because the thoughts of bringing policy in, into that system here in Germany have been made 10 years ago to be at the point where we are at, at the moment. So I think the major challenge will be on how, how can we align that speed how can, I think, also policymakers help, let's say, to find some basic rules which are not preventing future further developments and increase in technology, right, and changes? Thank you. Um, it's occurring to me as I look at the results, ladies and gentlemen, we can see the results still on our screen up here, that if we consider policymakers and regulators to be amongst the digital professionals, then uh, that 16% cent share is indeed quite low because you're telling us very clearly that regulators and policymakers essentially need to be brought along in terms of their uh, understanding. Please, Minister Barak. I, I, I was just going to say that uh, yes, we do regulation uh, ex ante, so we do something for five years later, for 10 years later, and maybe we do have a right to make some mistakes, but eventually, if you are, uh, I mean, what you're seeing today, I mean, uh, people are complaining and criticizing policymakers or regulators to rely on one single country on, or one single source of energy that creates a lot of problem in terms of security of supply. We might have that kind of difficulties and challenges in the future in terms of digital digitalization of energy. You can consider like a, a, we can rely on one single software in 10 years from now on. Can I just comment quickly? So I fully agree with your perspective as well, right? And I see the challenges. And this is also looking more from an entrepreneurship point of view. We always said like we want to build up a solution which can live without the policy having to change. 
right? Something which can support, let's say, um, the implementation increased speed, but in the end, let's say, startups have to live with the, with the stages at least how it is today, right? You cannot build your, your future business on something that there might be a change in policy. Um, I can give you an example. I'm waiting since 10 years that the Swiss energy market will be liberalized. And I think I will wait probably another 10, right? But that's <laughs> fine. That's just how the world is. Still, Tico is still alive. We have created there our business model. Um, it might, in that case, it worked out. There might be other cases where it doesn't then. Thank you very much. I want to go to um, Anna Trivovich because I wanted to get your take also on the poll result. And then I have a, a question as well about security to you. Uh, thank you. I will perhaps turn to energy access because uh, in my work I actually see uh, an intersection that some may not, which is one with transparent citizen involvement. Uh, because one can view energy access as a basic right to have literally access to energy usually translates to access to the grid because we still have uh, a significant portion of the globe with no access to the grid. And what happens in these communities is that do have some access through solar home management system or others that they end up paying more uh, for, for less um, because of the situation and also in part because the, the, the electricity that comes from the grid often in those exact regions tends to be heavily subsidized and not reflective of the real price. So we have a disconnect where uh, future solutions are developing and, and, and can develop to allow those communities to function off the grid uh, in a more optimal way. Uh, but as soon as a community connects with the grid, they no longer want this solution, uh, which helps to relieve congestion from the grid because the electricity from the grid is cheaper. So there is also a disconnect there. Then in contrast to such communities, we have communities in very advanced uh, economies where people get together uh, for energy access because they want to be off the grid, because they want to be self-sufficient, because they can, because they have the resources. They're usually experts themselves. Uh, they can afford to buy uh, the most advanced technology, uh, batteries to store everything to be off the grid and are proud uh, to be off the grid and self-sufficient and not dependent. Uh, and in the long term, they end up doing much better, right? Because they don't get charged every month and so forth. So again, we have a disconnect between who needs to be supported and who ends up having a better deal. Um, and this is, this, this, this is what, what needs to align. And to end on a positive note, as always an optimist, we are going in a good direction. Every single policymaker that I have met who has become educated, like you said, about blockchain, for example, uh, falls in love with the technology because it adds transparency, because it adds security, uh, because it adds efficiency, and it, because it goes very nicely with other technologies like AI and IoT, and it's always a hybrid uh, solution. But we do need to increase education. Uh, there are also uh, what are called regulatory test beds Right, which uh, are places where you can safely innovate. Uh, and there are many pilots around the world that have implemented solutions. Um, then there is a waiting room, right? W when do you decide and what do you need to decide to move from that pilot and that regulatory test bed to mainstream? This is where we get a little frustrated as innovators because, uh, like Sandra said, we adapt. Uh, our technology to what is possible in terms of regulation, but we know we could do a lot more if we were allowed to. Uh, and, and this is where we need to continue to mm -hmm. talk and have this dialogue, and that's why Beate Day has an important role, and that's why we're both here. Thank you very much. I'd like to just briefly pick up on the point here about secure and efficient, sustainable digital infrastructure. I'm not infrastructure. I'm not sure if it was you, Minister Lepowski, or you, Minister Barakta, who said perhaps the largest share being in that category has something to do with the current crisis that we're facing. And yeah, and concern about the security of our systems, critical infrastructure, particularly in view of potential cyber attacks. So uh, just briefly to you, Anna because blockchain is often conceived of as a particularly secure 
technology. Um, in general, not only with regard to blockchain, but how secure is our digital infrastructure? How vulnerable is it? Um, okay, maybe let's go back to this cloud. <laughs> um, uh, blockchain is more secure uh, because it is very difficult to hamper uh, with a blockchain-based solution and to manipulate uh, the data that is there and the set of transactions that follow uh, a certain path, uh, uh, which is usually called a smart contract, but essentially it means how, how are things done, what is the process, uh, you know, what steps are followed and what happens as a result. Uh, what is always vulnerable is the input, right? So if your input comes from a digital system, uh, a battery that is generating a certain output uh, at a certain time, and you're taking that as input, uh, that is more secure than someone, a person, copying from an Excel sheet uh, or, or telling you that's what, what the numbers are, right? So you can decrease the vulnerability input, but there's always that vulnerability at the beginning which cannot be prevented. Uh, one example of many cases that already work are these uh, renewable energy certificates, where instead of having uh, sets of people having to verify, yes, this is a, a hydro plant, yes, we can see this is what they produce on the, on the, uh, in the Excel, Excel sheet, instead you're just stamping minute by minute or second by second uh, uh, through the, whatever system you have there. You avoid uh, uh, cheating which happens in the system with double certificates. You can arrange for um, contracts in, in advance to, to purchase this. this one, that's one use case. Another use case is if a battery in your car has a digital ID, then you are not in a closed vendor system where only the owner Oh, the car manufacturer can decide who has access to, to the data from your car, from your battery, and use that for their own purpose and give you a product based on that. But you can, you can choose among other uh, providers uh, and use your battery not just for your car, but also to sell back at a certain time and provide a, a vehicle to grid service. Uh, simply, you have this interoperability that becomes more secure because you have this digital ID. Many countries have digital IDs for citizens. Uh, the digital ID for energy assets follows a similar system, but we now have a technology to do it in a more secure way. And let's say that everybody has a digital ID, uh, every asset does. Uh, that also allows you the possibility for everybody to keep their data and exchange what is needed for certain service to work, just like, again, we select apps and what we allow an app to do on our phone. This also prevents one cloud storing all of the information uh, because everybody can store theirs and exchange what is required for that particular use case. Um, so this is just, just to, to, to spark your curiosity about an alternative to, to, to one cloud. Thank you very much. And um, just very briefly, we have about two and a half minutes left, and I would like to just ask all of you, because a central theme of this conference is cooperation and how cooperation can take us forward in the energy transition. So put that together, if you would, with digital and tell me what would be the key priority in your view moving forward where cooperation is important or essential. Minister Lipovsky? Yes, uh, we need to be working on European common solution. That's absolutely clear. Uh, we have to do it in a matter of energy security. We have to do it uh, in an area of digitalization and regulation. And that basically uh, what would be my answer to that, to that question. So a common regulatory framework which would allow for these technologies to, to strive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister Barakta. Uh, to me, we can cooperate on, uh, uh, on the, the change management because the, the, the main question here is how are we going to be able to uh, successfully manage this change, big change, changes happening in the, in the world of energy. The uberiz uberization of uh, distribution system or utilities is, is happening right now. And the, uh, some colleague mentioned already the speed of change is enormous. So how are we going to, uh, let's say, manage this uh, change of speed? So uh, we need to cooperate on uh, that front. Also, 
Uh, very important things on cybersecurity, again, another cooperation area uh, we all uh, share. Uh, and also we can learn from different sectors. It's not only energy, but banking sector, telecommunication, they're already having these uh, just questions. And one last thing to the private sectors, to innovators that try to be more uh, simple, to simplify things for consumers, becoming more consumer friendly, and for also policymakers and regulators would be really nice. Thank you so much. And Minister Meza. Um, I will say that uh, we need to continue this collaboration with, well, these dialogues with the private sector. And, and I, I totally uh, agree with the minister. It's very important that we continue having these conversations between all these innovators and the policymakers. This is very important. Continuing piloting. Uh, there is, I know that then we want to scale up things, but we're still in the phase of where we need to continue in doing some piloting. And of course, this uh, cooperation between uh, developing countries and developed countries, it will be crucial again, because uh, we are uh, facing a lot of these challenges. And, and again, it's very important that we leave no one behind in this transition. Thank you so much. Sandra Trittin? Yeah, bringing the word of cooperation to the people attending here uh, on that panel, I think what has been just mentioned, I think is crucial to keep the continuous exchange. Also, the speed of exchange, I think, has to increase because we are talking about technology, which is quickly changing, um, is crucial. And then I think also what has been just uh, mentioned from the minister uh, before, that on one side we can still pilot, but also how can we help to secure policymakers to go to the next level to make it a possibility for mass market applications. Mm -hmm. So not only to learn and to exchange knowledge from both sides, but also how can we support in a day-to-day -day business a bit each other on how to move forward more quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Anna Trubovic. Uh, I believe I, also, I have already um, concluded in a way, so I, I can only reiterate uh, that we will always be back and find time to talk. Mm -hmm. um, and you should also meet your entrepreneurs uh, in your countries uh, and, and, and listen to them and, and, and try to create these goalposts. You know, how much evidence do you need to move forward with the policy? Maybe we leave that as, as a final note. Mm -hmm. Um, and one example, we actually had a hackathon with a young Turkish entrepreneur who involves students uh, from a university last week uh, to, to start that bug early, to make them think out of the box, uh, like you said, thinking about a completely new market design. Uh, because it is not the technology that has disrupted the market, the market is already disrupted, and we need to use this technology to better manage uh, the market that is distributed and disrupted. Thank you so much to all of you. It's been a very lively and interesting discussion. We appreciate it very much. Let's give them a nice round of applause. <laughs>